Okay, students, so now that we have had a wonderful introduction and uh, we uh, introduced each other, uh, I mean ourselves to each other, so now let's begin with the class. We are going to deal with chapter one today of International Law of the Sea. So what do you understand by law of the sea? It's nothing but just maritime laws and the chunk of International Law of the Sea basically deals with the subject of the waters, the territorial waters, or the waters in uh, in the world, waters internationally, and how the governments regulate the relationship with uh, you know with one another. How the countries regulate the relationship with one another with respect to their maritime areas, with respect to the seas, the rivers, and the territorial seas, and so on. So it's an interesting subject. So let's just dive in directly and move to the first chapter, which is the introductory chapter. I'll just share my screen with you. We'll begin with the PowerPoint slide. So in the so in the first chapter, we are going to talk about the history of the development of the law of the sea, that is how the law of the sea developed over the years. So before that, we will learn what means the law of the sea. I'm sure before coming to this class, you've uh, already tried to read something, also try to find out on your own what it means by, uh, what the phrase in fact means, uh, the law of the sea, what it really means. As we all know that the entire world for that purpose, it depends on free trade, commerce and effective communication. And that goes without saying. And one of the modes of such trade or such transportation and communication is of course by sea. So what you can expect in this subject is you will learn um, you know, a, you know, a particular um, you know, uh, international regulation or international law, which actually comprises of uh, you know, the body of customs, treaties, and also international covenants or agreements by which all the government, governments in the world, they maintain order, productivity, and also you will be amazed to learn how they maintain peaceful relations on the sea when it comes to the matters of the water. So sometimes it happens that countries, you know, they get into loggerheads or they are engaged in disputes or fights over the international water zones where they have fights over fishing zones. One country says, no, this is my fishing zone and so on. However, international law of the sea makes it, uh, you know, possible or, you know, it has made it possible that, uh, you know, the, 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 the territorial waters or the waters are demarcated and they're easily demarcated uh, as into coming into the jurisdiction of one particular country. Like, for instance, you could say that an additional 12 miles of water, like, you know, an example of an international dispute of waters is there was a dispute uh, where Russia engaged into a dispute where 12 miles of water was claimed by Russia earlier in 1900s as their fishing zone. They said no. From their territorial waters, they said no additional 12 miles of water was claimed by Russia in the early 1900s. And they said, no, that comes under our fishing zone area. So the principle here is that the state, so in international law for countries, we refer to as state. So the principle here is that the state that owns the surrounding land desires to extend its right even to the adjacent and surrounding waters. So this law of the sea, what it determines is the extent of such dominance or the extent of, uh, you know, uh, such, um, uh, you know, ownership, you could say, or such dominance and the parameters of sovereignty over the surrounding waters. Now, early in the 17th century, uh, Portugal, you know, claimed huge tracts of high seas as part of their territorial domain. Now, this claim was controverted and criticized by a person called Hugo Grotius, who was actually a Dutch statesman and is a renowned scholar of international law and was considered, in fact, the father of international law. So this person, Hugo Grotius, uh, you know, he, you know, criticized Portugal's claim over huge tracts of high seas as saying uh, where they said that it is part of their territorial domain and Hugo Grotius didn't like it. And therefore, therefore uh, he felt that, you know, there is a need for a particular law to be developed in this area and such squabbles or fights 
were actually snowballed into disputes. And finally, law of the sea developed. So how the law of the sea developed? The law of the sea is sea developed because of uh, the, the disputes between the nations where they are fighting this portion of the water is mine this portion of the water is yours uh, you know you cannot fish in this area and so on and so forth and that's how even the nations began dividing waters among themselves in fact water is a natural resource so it's amazing that how the world has begun even fighting over of the free natural resource of water is the seas and so on. And that's how the demarcation began. And there were fights and these fights led to the development of the law of the sea. And Hugo Grotius is considered as a father of international law. Now, he, uh, there was a particular write-up by Hugo Grotius and uh, that is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, he wrote a treatise rather, it was a kind of a treatise or, you know, um, an, a, a huge written material or a treatise, which is called as kind of a book. And uh, it's called Mare Liberim uh, in 1609. And he documented what he had written. And in that Mare Liberim, he made mention of the need of regulating the seas by systemic law and opine that the law of the sea is a body of international law governing the rights and duties of the states, that is countries in maritime environments. So he expounded the doctrine of the open seas. He explained the doctrine of the open seas and he opined that the oceans as rest communists and this cannot be commonly appropriated and be accessible to all nations. And his work sparked criticism as well. Nevertheless, it did result in the development of the law of the sea. Now, law of the sea is that branch of law that deals with the regulation of international waters, territorial waters, and maintaining public order regulated by international covenants and treaties. So it governs even maritime commerce, maritime trade. That's how your ships move over the waters. Uh, it is a branch of codified international law that is uh, where the law is codified regarding territorial waters, sea lanes, and resources. Now, Merriam-Webster's Law Dictionary defines the law of the sea as a body of international law which is promulgated by the United Nations Convention and covering a range of ocean matters, including territorial zones, access to and transit on the sea, environmental preservation, and the resolution of international disputes. Now we have the Law of the Sea Convention of 1958. Now this is the prominent law when it comes to the Law of the Sea. This is very important. The Law of the Sea Convention of 1958, which served as a precursor to the development of codified law in this area. This Law of the Sea Convention, or we could call it as LOSC, it encompasses within its ambit three other conventions, that is, Convention on the Territorial Sea and the Contiguous Zones, Convention on the High Seas, and Convention on the Fishing and Conservation of Resources of the High Seas. I'll repeat it again for you. This Law of the Sea Convention of 1958 has three other conventions within its umbrella or within its ambit. What are the three other conventions under the Law of the Sea Convention? They are Convention on the Territorial Sea and the Contiguous Zones, Convention on the High Seas, Convention on the Fishing and Conservation of Resources of the High Seas. See, for now, I do not want you to be confused about, you know, what are the high seas? What is she talking about? We will learn about all of it in the forthcoming lectures as well. And I'll give you a brief introduction, uh, just a brief introduction uh, of this entire subject for this class. Okay, and for now, we'll just deal with history and the basic conventions which are part of the international law of the sea. Okay, but I'll explain to you what are the high seas, what are the territorial waters, and um, what, what it means when they say fishing zones and uh, so on. Next is 
Um, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, this particular convention was signed on December 10th, 1982, and it came into force in 1994 with the requisite number of 60 nations that, uh, in fact, there were like, you know, 117 for a start, which acceded to the terms and ratified the treaty. Later on, there was 150 more countries which were made to the, you know, they were made a party to the treaty upon ratification. Ratification means they have agreed to the terms of the convention. And it is worthwhile to know that USA is not a part of this convention, but is a party to the 1956 convention. And it follows other international customary provisions that may be reflective of the 1982 convention. So before we actually move further or delve further, let us first understand what means territorial seas. So in this subject, you're going to hear a lot about territorial seas. So what are territorial seas? Now the treaty UNCLOS defines, that is, United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea. It defines territorial waters as those extending 12 nautical miles, that is 22 kilometers beyond a country's coast from the baseline low water mark and gives to each country exclusive fishing and mining rights in waters extending to 200 nautical miles that is 370 kilometers from its coast. You know, in the next class, I'll explain it to you with the help of a diagram as well, but this is by way of uh, definition. So say that, you know, what is the definition? Let me re repeat it for you again. Now, what are territorial waters? Now, by the name itself, you would understand Territorial waters are those waters which come under the jurisdiction of one particular country. It is demarcated by a territory. Okay. So now what is the exact definition is like from the baseline that is the lowest watermark of a country's coast. Okay. From that point, you take to 12 nautical miles, that is 22 kilometers, from the baseline of the coast of that particular country, that would be considered as territorial waters. Now, in these territorial waters, that particular country has got the right of exclusive fishing and mining rights in waters extending to 200 nautical miles, that is 370 kilom kilometers from its coast. Are you understanding me? Are you understanding me? Or should I repeat? Can you repeat? Okay, sure. Now see, again, I'm repeating. I want you to imagine the situation. There is a country, okay? So how territorial waters means those waters over which any particular country can exercise right over. They have the right over their own territorial waters, okay? Now, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea defines territorial waters as those extending 12 nautical miles, that means 22 kilometers beyond a country's coast from the baseline low water mark and gives to each country exclusive fishing and mining rights in the waters extending to plus 200 nautical miles, that is 370 kilometers from its coast. So territorial waters are those waters where the country has got the right, okay? It, it, you know, it, it comes within its jurisdiction and that country has got the right of fishing in the, that particular area. Are you understanding me? Yes, indeed. Okay. So, so now, how would we put it in simple terms? How would you put it in simple terms? And you could also say that, like, you know, it's water that is immediately adjacent to the shores of a particular country, and it comes within the jurisdiction of that particular country. Are you understanding? So it is that portion of the water where the country has jurisdiction over, it has got power over, and within that particular region, 
they can fish mine and so on so what are the like what are the kilometers there what is the uh, you know the 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 extent that they can uh, really exercise the right on a jurisdiction on is 12 nautical miles 22 kilometers beyond their coast from the baseline low water mark and it gives to each country exclusive fishing and mining rights in waters which extend to 200 nautical miles 370 from its coast so territorial waters are thus waters that are immediately adjacent to the country's state territory or shores of the state and they're subject to the authority and governance of the state. Now, trespassing over those waters is not permitted. That means any other country's boats cannot simply come within the, the, the jurisdiction or the boundary of another country. Say there is country A and it is enjoying its territorial waters. Country B, without the permission of country A, cannot, en cannot enter its boundary, cannot enter its territory. So trespassing over the waters is not permitted, but the other state parties, its vessels, they might have a right of innocent passage, which means an authorized passage over the waters in compliance with international law and all the protocols followed. We will see also what means right of innocent passage in the subsequent chapters. Then we have the concept of um, contiguous zones. Now, what are these contiguous zones? Contiguous zones are where additional water stretches beyond the limit or the outer edge of the territorial sea, 24 nautical miles, that is 44 kilometers approx, from the baseline within which the state exercises control and inflicts punishment for the infringement of its territorial limits. That is, the relevant laws and regulations, they govern, uh, you know, uh, the infliction of punishment and so on. That is, if anyone trespasses into their area, they would, you know, immediately, uh, it, it would be considered as an infringement of its territorial limits and there would be a particular punishment that would be inflicted on the particular vessel which trespasses into these contiguous zones. Now, the state or any country can exercise its power over these contiguous zones in order to prevent or punish trespass over its waters an infringement of relevant provision of law and regulations granting it right over the waters. For example, there are straight canals and so on. Uh, I mean, I will explain to you in the next class by way of a diagram, um, what are these contiguous zones? Next is what are internal waters? These are just kind of definitions because the first class that I want you to just understand. So what are internal waters? This is area which is within the country or within the state. So in international law, we use the word state, okay, for a country. So what are inter internal waters? It is an area within which the state exercises complete sovereignty over the water. Like, for example, you have rivers, canals, those are internal waters. Next is what are high seas again? Waters beyond the territorial seas. We spoke about the territorial sea. We spoke about the territorials being, uh, you know, 12 nautical miles and so on. Now, what is the high sea? So the waters which are beyond, that is after the territorial seas, are international waters or the high sea over which every nation state can freely use. However, illegal activities and criminal activities are forbidden and would constitute an international offense. Example, piracy, slave trade, though it is the open waters, but still illegal activities are not permitted on the high seas. So every nation and every state has got a right to sail its vessel flying its flag over the high seas. Now, high sea is defined by the Merriam-Webster's dictionary as the open ocean, especially that one within any country's jurisdiction, and they're also called as ABNJ, that is area beyond national jurisdiction. So the primary dual function of the law of the sea is the dissemination of authority over the waters and the seas. That is internal waters, sea, territorial seas, um, contiguous zones and high seas, eliciting international cooperation between the states. And two, that encourages international cooperation over matters pertaining to the seas and the management of resources. So next class, we'll learn about the passage of international vessels on territorial waters. Do you have any questions? So this class is just an introductory class where we just learned that 
international law of the sea we are going to learn two basic conventions here one is the law of the sea convention of 1958 which has three conventions under that and we will learn about uh, the united nations convention on the law of the sea of 1982 i am repeating we are going to learn the two primary conventions here under the law of the sea is the law of the sea convention of 1958 and under this we have three conventions that is convention on the territorial sea and the contiguous zones convention on the high seas convention on the fishing and conservation of resources of the high seas and then we are going to learn the united nation convention on the law of the sea of 1982 so which are the two conventions 1958 and 1982 these are the two basic primary conventions which comprises of the entire chunk of the law of the sea so 1958 one has got three other conventions and we also going to talk about the 1982 conventions so today we just went through the definitions <laughs> sorry as an introduction we just saw what is the definition of the territorial sea we saw what is the definition of contiguous zones we saw what is the definition of the high seas we saw what are the internal waters so next class we are going to learn about the passage of international vessels on territorial waters let me know if you have any questions any questions Okay, I'm repeating the question. What are the two basic conventions of the international law of the sea? Uh, if I try, if I try the answer of this question, I think there are two uh, conventions uh, which was uh, uh, taken in uh, 1958 and the one that was taken in, in 1982. Perfect. Okay. And in 1958, there, under that convention, there are three more. What are they? I think they are convention of the territorial sea and the contiguous zone. Correct. Convention of the high seas. Correct. Uh, convention of the high seas. Convention of resources of the high seas. Okay. Now, what I'll do is, uh, just give me a moment. I'll try to explain to you right now by way of a diagram so that it's easy for you. I wanted to take it for the next class, but uh, I'll just explain just the diagram for you. Just a moment. Okay. So. One minute. One minute. Okay. Uh, is the screen clear for you? Hello. Yes. Okay. Uh, Very just, clear. Uh, yeah, we're going to close the class. Don't worry. But just to explain to you, okay, we were talking about the territorial seas, remember? I'll teach you the exclusive economic zone later, but just to teach you about the territorial sea. Do you see now this portion here? You can see the baseline. Okay. Can you see the baseline there? So from the baseline, 12 nautical miles is considered as territorial sea. From the baseline, 24 nautical miles is considered as a contiguous zone. Are you understanding? Now, from there, we spoke about the 200 nautical miles, which includes the exclusive economic zone, which we'll study again next class. Okay. And beyond this portion is the high sea. Now, this green portion you know, is a portion of a country, okay, a particular state. So the baseline coast area, 12 nautical miles, is a territorial sea. 24 nautical miles from the baseline coast is a contiguous zone. Okay, and from the baseline, you have the exclusive economic zone. Okay, that is out of, uh, you know, it goes up to 200 nautical miles. And after that is the high sea. What are these high seas? Means it does not come under any particular nation. It does not come under any particular state. In international law, we call it a state. 
So it does not come under any particular country. So every country can use the high C. Are you understanding me? Yes, sure. Okay. So this is the diagram, which I wanted you to know, because we learned the definition, but without the diagram, probably it would be difficult for you. And I do not want you to you know, uh, be under the impression that the subject is difficult. In fact, the subject is very easy if you try to understand that. So in today's class, we just spoke a little bit about the history of how international law of the sea developed. The international law of the sea developed because of the squabbles that the countries had over the waters. Remember, water is a natural resource, but you know it's a free gift from God. But still, nations started fighting over the use of those waters, and those small squabbles began. Huge, I mean, it snowballed into big disputes, and that's how there was a need for coming up with rules and regulations pertaining to water and countries started claiming over you know certain areas of water and that's how we have the concept of territorial sea that is where any nation can exercise its rights over then they have contiguous zones economic exclusive economic zone where they can carry out their fishing and so on or mining and so on and after that Okay, so beyond that zone, they're calling it high seas. That means any nation and every nation and every international state party can use that high seas. Everybody can use the high seas. Every nation can use the high seas. But you cannot indulge or any nation cannot indulge in any, say, criminal activity or illegal activity on the high seas. Though the high seas belong to everybody, but still criminal activity or any anything, anything illegal like smuggling and so on, or piracy, you know, uh, it, it's like, uh, it is not, uh, in a sense, it's prohibited in international law. It's against the law, though the high seas belong to everybody. I hope I made the concept clear. And who's the father of international law? It's Hugo Grotius. Right? So did you understand now? Did you understand? Yes. Okay. I understood. You understood. Thank you. And uh, we meet again next Thursday at the same time. But again, next Thursday, we're going to start on time. Try to be on time and don't enter the class late. We'll have, uh, say, maximum 10 minutes buffering. Beyond that, I'll not admit any students. That's for the, in your best interest. You know why? So that the other students who are coming on time will not be, uh, you know, they'll not be disturbed. I don't want them to be disturbed when you enter the class late. But uh, in case you want to, I mean, there is something that you have and uh, there is a possibility that you might come late. So just let me know in advance that you will be late to class and then I will admit you in, okay? So see you next class and uh, just revise whatever we have discussed in today's class. I will just upload the notes along with the PPT slides so you can study it and ask me any questions even the next class, if you're not able to understand anything. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome, Mohammed. So take care, everyone. So, take care. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. Care. Welcome. Good night.